Hi, and back to part two of uh, paper one. So we're now going to move into stem and leaf, look at some bar charts, uh, problem solving, conversion, and uh, more problem solving, and that's the end. So as you can see, there's not a huge amount in there, um, so it's just more practicing these things. So the exam marks of classes 4A and B are shown in the back-to-back -back stem and leaf diagram below. So we've got class 4A and class 4B. I've actually got a handy little key here just showing what the numbers mean. So 5-1 equals 51. So what that's saying is this number here is 54 and this and this is 51 and 55. This is 91, 92, 92. This is 94, 96, 97. And we even got the total numbers of all the classes. We have 15 people in this class and 18 people in this class. So the first thing is what's the highest mark in class 4B? Well here's 4B. The marks are 51, 55, 64, 68. So the highest mark is going to be over here, and that is 99. So I'm going to highlight that. The highest mark is 99, just so you can see. So 99. And what is the mean mark in 4A? Now, this is the only thing I'm not going to work through because it's quite straightforward. But you want to write all the numbers and divide it by 15. Okay, so if I actually just work through it, so you've got 54 plus 56 plus 59, plus 62, plus 65. I'm not going to work through it, it's, going to, it's just quite slow on, on this. And you would keep going. So it's all these numbers divided by 15 to give you the mean mark. Okay. So 54, 56, 59, 62, yeah, divided by 15. And that would give you your mean mark. If the mean mark for class 4B was 81.6, which class did better? So this mean mark is 81.6. I'm going to assume that the mean mark for this class, looking at it, is in the 70s. I'm just going to assume that. I'm going to say the mean mark is about 74 or something. So if the mean mark was 81.6, which class did better? Well, you would just say 4B did better because 81.6 is greater than 74 or whatever you calculate here. So nothing tricky. Just take your time with your calculator at this bit. People always make mistakes um, adding up on their calculator. So just be careful to write all your numbers out and then be careful to enter them in your calculator. Okay, it does take a little bit of time. It's going to mean something to give you so many uh, bits of data. Uh, question nine, so we've got a beautiful bar graph here. Um, days of the week and each bar graph is S1, S2 and S3 and it's how many were absent. The question asks on which day was the least number of S2 pupils absent? So S2 is the red, so when is the red the smallest? So it looks to me as if it's smallest. On Monday, so you just say Monday. So you have S2 is red. Where's the, the graph smallest? By contrast, it looks as if Monday is the day when the most S3 pupils are absent. Uh, Friday looks like the day the least S3 pupils are absent. Wednesday looks like the day that the, the least S1 pupils are absent. So just to give you a bit of what this graph's telling. Uh, by estimating absences for each day, so I don't add them up exactly, just have a look at the graphs and try and picture it. On which day were the least absences? So where are the bar graphs the smallest? It's definitely not Monday. Monday's quite big. Tuesday's consistently quite high. I'd say Thursday's consistently quite high as well. To me, it's between Wednesday and Friday, and I think I'm going to give it to Friday. Okay, I bet if you actually did want to add them up, so that looks like 6, 7, and 14, that would come out. The lowest okay because these graphs are much lower i'd say than these ones so friday looks like a day where absentees are the least but if you wanted to actually work it out you could just physically look and say well there are six people there are seven people and there's 14 so that's 27 and then add up this one here that looks to me like 3 10 and 16. 3 10 and 16 so yeah that's probably closer to 29, so it's quite tight, but I'd say this is still slightly less. Okay, this is a question that's done quite badly, I would say. And it's a shame because it's very easy. It's just something that people get stressed out with because it's quite a worthy question. So I've got bottles of mineral water and they're packed in boxes of 75. So I've got a box, and in each box I've got 75 bottles. And a local supermarket has ordered 25 boxes. So how many bottles has a shop ordered? 
Well, I've got 25 boxes, and each box is 75. So it's just going to be 75 times 25. I'm just going to do that in my calculator because, again, it's quite late and I'm quite tired. Treat myself to the calculator. So it's going to be 1875 bottles. And this is where it starts to get a little bit trickier. So each bottle holds 290 ml. So again, I'll just I'll visualize that. Okay, I'll just draw a little um a little ball. Okay, so the 290 milliliters. That's the first bit of the question. And one liter one liter of water weighs one kilogram. So what that means is that 290 mil equals 290 grams. Okay, so for every milliliter you've got a gram, because for one liter you've got a kilogram. So milliliters is grams, that's all that's in. And each empty bottle weighs 30. So that's how much fluid I've got. But then I'm going to have to add to that the 30 grams that the actual bottle itself weighs. So that's going to give me 320 grams for each bottle. So that's been done that bit as well. What does the total weight to be delivered? So that's how much each bottle weighs. I've got this number of bottles. Simply just multiply them. The only thing we could do to make our life a little bit easier is to say that that is equal, that is equal to 0 0.32 kilograms because there's a thousand grams in a kilogram, so I need to divide this by a thousand to get the number of kilograms. So I would take my decimal point, which is down, I'll draw this in green, down here, and I'm going to divide by 10, 100, and 1000 to get 0 0.32 kilograms. So a bottle of water is 0 0.32 kilograms, and we're going to times that by the number of bottles, which is 1875. So that's going to give me 600. Wait, there's an orange here. That's 600 kilograms. The last bit of the question says, if the delivery van can take 650, can this order be delivered? Well, yes, it can. As 600 is less than 650 kilograms. That is a less than simple. simple as that. So make sure you say if it can or not, and then numerically say why, because the weight is less than the maximum weight. So please, for this question, write down what you've got. Try and visualise it. There's nothing here that anyone can do. It's very simple first year work, but people always get confused. And I think the units gets people as well. And that's all you're doing. A milliliter is a gram. And then you've got to divide by a thousand to get into kilograms. And you could have done that question, you could have done the 1875 times 1320, and then divided by a thousand to get very big numbers very quick. So, pretty straightforward, just take your time. It's my only advice for that one. And then we're on the home straight, the last two questions. Question 11 uh, we've got Mike's going on holiday, lucky guy, he's going to change. $1,200, so £1,000 into Aussie dollars. And we've got the exchange rate down here. So how many Australian dollars will Mike receive? So I always just write this out first. I always say, right, well, £1 is equal to $162. Get the symbol for that. will be like this. And he's going to £1,200. So I'm going from £1 to £1,200. So I'm timesing by £1,200, yeah? Both sides of that equation have to be times by 1,200. So 1 1.62 times 1,200 is equal to $1,944. Pretty straightforward. Okay, if we're going to a different currency, effectively we're multiplying. That's the basics of it. But if you want to think about what we're doing, it's kind of similar to ratio. We invert our ratio down, and then we see, right, okay, well, this is going up to 1,200. So I need to times both sides of my equation by 1,200. While Mike is on holiday, he spends $1,450. How many dollars has he got left? So I'm just going to put my answer over here for the first bit. So that's $1,944. So he spends $1,450. Sorry, $1,450. He's only got $494 left. I just take away that value. And when he returns home, he's going to change it back. So I've got a new exchange rate. And we're going to change it back. So the new exchange rate is one pound 
is equal to $171. And he's going to change back to £494. Now I'm going to make this a wee bit trickier than what the question says. I'm going to say they can only change in multiples of 10 as well. So this question is showing 494 and they can only change in multiples of 10. So that means we're actually going to change 490. So imagine you turned up with you know, your 10s, your 20s, all your big notes, and that four is like your four coins. Basically, the places don't really want your coins. They only really deal in 10s. So when you get this question, if you came up with 499 pounds, they would say, sorry, mate, you're keeping that nine pounds in, in dollars. Okay. Well, that's right, that. But if they got the $499, you're keeping that $9 and change. So you might get that in the question. So we've got $490 and we want to change back to pounds. So how do I get from dollars to pounds? Well, I divide. Okay, last time I was multiplying, this time I'm going to divide. So I'll take 490 and I'm going to divide it by 1.71. So that's 286. So what I'm saying here is that 286 pounds 286 pounds is equal to 490 dollars because to get from 1.71 to 1 I've got to divide by 1.71 so on this equation we did the same we divided by 1.71 now you could if you weren't sure you could try times in it but it wouldn't quite look right because then you'd have 490 dollars and be getting back about you know 700 800 pounds and we can see here that it makes sense that the pound number is lower than the dollar number. Okay, so it, you're divided or multiplying, and if you did just common sense check, the divide makes sense. So he's going to get, if he changes 490 back, he's going to get 286. Now this wanted it to the nearest pound, so actually it's 296.55. So to the nearest pound, that's actually 200. And 87, so 286.55. So the change to dollars were multiplying. We then did a little calculation to see what we had left. The only hard bit, I think, is understanding this concept of if we've got 494 left and the exchange rate place only takes a multiple of 10, then we've got 490 left. This last little bit here, we just have to ditch. That's what's left in your pocket. When you come back from holiday, those four euros, those four cents, whatever, it's this 490 that we can exchange. And how do we go back the way? Well, we divide. We multiply to get there, we're dividing to come back. And then I just did a little bit around it at the end. Good stuff. Okay, so the last question, I'm just going to move this up a little bit. If I'll do the last question in a separate video, okay.